Okay, so Father, we do ask that you would reveal a little more to us today now. Um, however you want to do that, Jesus, whether you bring up a memory or a picture, or it's something that you say through me, or it's a film clip, whatever it is, Father, we ask you to speak a little more, put a little more light on our life and our heart, and especially on those things that have been hidden from us but are needed now. And so come and speak to us. We invite you to do this, Father, that we would actually live the life you've given us to live. We want to do that now. And we bring the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ against anything that's set against us time, our heart, our calling, our effect, the glory of our life. And we forbid any sort of interference from distraction to tiredness to confusion, to anything now. We come against all of those things working against us in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we bring the kingdom of Jesus now over this room and our eyes and our ears and our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, you know, look, look no, no, no. real quickly, let me show you just uh, just kind of tell you what's out there because what what's difficult, what's been difficult for me is Usually what I talk about is through seven sessions, and we have three. And so there's things in between that I can't quite get to. So let me just tell you real quickly, the, 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 um, the call and retreat, all the sessions live are right here in this one called The Glory of Your Life. So it's seven sessions. It's all of these things from orientation to glory to uh, mystery, assault, discovery, development, journey. It's all in there. Um, of course, the book is more than that. It's just Gosh, they required me to write 50,000 words. I don't think I speak that many in this. So anyway, there's other stories, other things in, and there's a book on tape or the audio book. Um, my wife just, we just got this manufacturer called Sheer Beauty, and it's, it's amazing. It's when she was in Australia, they, they taped it, and it, she's, um, she's a master with media. In fact, she's a nightmare if you have to be the AV guy, which I was once, and she fired me. <laughs> she did. She just said, no more, Gary. You're never doing it for me again. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't manage it. But she's got phenomenal material. And then, and then this, is, this is just going through the stages of life and what are the key questions and things you need to put in place for those things. So, And Unveiling Your Purpose is a one-hour summary of all of this material. So anyway. Okay. So what I want to play for you is uh, this trailer from October Sky. It's a great movie, but the trailer is so good. Uh, when it comes to something that God has put on your heart that makes you unique and it's your effect in the world. So let me play this trailer. And I'll edit that green screen off next time. <laughs> You see Sputnik go over the other night? Anywhere in the world, someone could look up and see exactly what I saw. To everyone else, it was just a light in the sky. Let them have outer space. We got rock and roll. But to Homer Hickam, it was the future. Sputnik is a milestone in history. And just maybe a way out. College scholarships for winning a science fair? I'm going to build a rocket. You better take an interest in your own town. Just don't blow yourself up. Hey, what do you want to know about rockets? Everything. Lucky ones get out on football scholarship. How about I believe in the unlucky ones? You better have a talk with your son, Elsie. He's out of control. Would you please sign my newspaper? H-O-M. This is great, Miss Riley. I learned everything. Uh-oh. Waiting for the night. Oh, thank you, good Lord, that you didn't kill anybody. Things are bad at the mine. Yeah, he's stuck in the middle. Well, you put all this nonsense behind you, Homer. It isn't nonsense. It sure was exciting watching your rockets go up. I know I'm going to be a miner. I've known my entire life. I have no choice. As long as you are alive on this planet, you have a choice. From the producer of Field of Dreams, a Joe Johnston film. Call March, your life is not mine. Universal Pictures presents... The true story of a boy who risked everything for a dream. You want to get out of here so bad, then go. No! Yeah, I'll go! I won't even look back! Sometimes, you just can't listen to what anybody else says. You just gotta listen inside. This spring, turn your eyes to the sky and watch what happens when everything you believe in soars. I think we got a chance. October sky.
Okay. So in light of what we've been talking about with orientation, right, being alert and oriented times three, the three things, always alert and oriented to story, the story we're living in, the context, the environment, as well as our own story, desire, right, the desires of our heart, what has God written there, and journey, we're all on this journey, this pilgrimage, this developmental process that's going on. In light of that, and if you were in here Yesterday, we talked about the whole idea of the, that your calling is to bring the weightiness, the glory of your life to the world, wherever you are. We tend to make it a place, right? It's on the mission field. It's in a church. It's in a ministry. But the place has nothing to do with it. It's bringing the weightiness of your life wherever you are. Now, in light of those things, what grabs you about this, this uh, trailer? What did you notice? What are you picking up? Because there are some really strong themes in that thing. Which was what? Uh, for him to follow his, in his footsteps and his role. Right. Well, I don't even know who was his role. <laughs> right. Someone, his dad, handing him a script and saying, this is your life. This is what you're going to be, right? And him having to fight that, right? That's not my life. And that, that other young boy, right, his, his friend, he said, I know I was going to be a coal miner my whole life. Right? He just felt like I have no choice, right? What else? You do. Yep. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Lance that said, no, no, it was you. You were saying, Chris, about you're going to have to fight for this, right? Yeah. For what you're supposed to do, you have to fight for. It's Paul's statement of, um, <laughs> I told you I'm bad at Bible memory. Um, um, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, right? Press on means to strenuously pursue. So Christ set us free to bring the glory of our life to the world, and we're going to have to strenuously pursue that. So he had to do that. He had to fight for that. Right? What else in this? The belief of the teacher, like her, yeah. her love irrational her. belief in him. Yeah. Right. I love her statement to begin with, how about if I believe in the unlucky ones, right? Which is everybody else that doesn't play football, you know. And then what was her statement at the end? Something like, Right, right. And then she said something, now of course I have to look here to see it, but she said something else about, um, oh, as long as you are alive on this planet, you have a choice. See, the, the big thing that, that happens with, you know, for those of us who have experienced with Wild of Heart and other things is, one of the big things you get out of that experience in that book or the conference is permission. And that's a big thing for everyone, man and women, and men and women, is permission to live out your own heart and not the scripts of other people you know, to dig in there. Um, I, the very beginning line, okay, so it's, you usually, we usually lose the beginning lines because we keep getting to the next line, next line, but he says, to everyone else, it was just a light in the sky, but to Homer Hickam, it was the future. Right, so people went out, they looked up, they saw a satellite, said, cool, and they went back to their life. But Homer couldn't leave it. It grabbed him. It was, how does that work? How do you make that happen? What, is the, what, could, what could occur because of that? See, and there, that's very true of you and I. When I kept saying the glory of your life, there's a particular way that you see, a particular way that you hear, a particular effect that you have. There, you see certain things that no one else sees. And it's just you. You can't help it. He couldn't help it. You know, so eventually, based on a true story, you know, one of the Air Force bases in Hawaii is called uh, Hickam Air Force Base. I mean, the effect of his life was huge, but he could see something no one else could. You know, his best buddy. He sees a satellite and says, yeah, but we got rock and roll. <laughs> you know? He couldn't even conceive of what he was seeing. So we do see a certain way. And that, I love that about him. OK, so let me, let me give you this quote. This is by Francis of Assisi. He said, keep a clear eye towards life's end. And do not forget your purpose or destiny as God's creature. Um, what you are in his sight is what you are and nothing more. Don't let worldly cares and anxieties or the pressures of office blot out the divine life within you or the, or the voice of God's spirit guiding you in the great task of leading humanity to wholeness. If you open yourself up to God and his plan printed deeply in your heart, God will open himself up to you. I, I love that quote. I, I love this description of our great task of leading humanity to wholeness. 
Okay, it wasn't just leading humanity to Christ. It was to wholeness, right? Not just to salvation, but wholeness, right? The, the, the coming alive that Christ wants to bring to our heart and then the effect that that has on society and culture and the world and business and education and the seven mountains and all of that. I love that. And that's why we have to bring the effect of our, world, of our life to the world, not just our skills. All right. Um, let me take you back to this verse because I, I bring this up again and again and is absolutely core. Why did nothing come up here? Oh, this is just, this technology thing around you guys is unbelievable. It works everywhere else. <laughs> this is such a key verse, and I keep bringing this up, but this is core, right? For it is God who is producing in you both the desire and the ability to do what pleases him, right? It goes back to, we have to go back to desire. We have to go there. Again, don't confuse calling with competency. It's a different thing. So we go back to our desires once again, but this is what I want to say as we get into how do we read our heart. And that is, and I was having a conversation with somebody about this. Oh, it might have been Joan at dinner. You know, not every desire is good. We know that, right? We've lived long enough that we know not every desire is good or right or pure. It isn't. And so we, we cannot be naive people when it comes to operating desire. But you can't avoid desire to be safe and think we're going to find our life or have an impact in the world. You, you can't even love God without desire. So we've got, to, we've got to live in the realm of desire, but we have to be careful. It requires maturity, wisdom, cunningness to operate in the field of desire. Um, Proverbs 14, 15 says, um, the naive believes everything, but the sensible, and another word for that in scripture is shrewd, but the shrewd man or woman considers his or her steps. Right? So we don't, we're not naive. We don't just believe everything's good and everything's right. But we venture in and we consider our steps, right? We just consider. We're discerning. To be cunning. Or another verse, very similar, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. It doesn't say avoid everything carefully. It says examine everything carefully and hold on to that which is good. So we have to be cunning, mature, wise, discerning people if we're going to operate in the realm of desire. But we have to go there. We absolutely have to go there. Just real quickly, th there, are, there are at least uh, four areas that desire comes from. The first is the flesh, right? We know that. Paul says, um, let me get over here. He said, listen, um, now I don't want you to be naive. He said, you know, the, the desires of the flesh are evident. They're supposed to be to us. We're supposed to know what the fleshly desires are like. So when it comes up, we can go, no, that's flesh. I'm not going there. But he, he kind of goes, he, he writes a list, okay? I'm not going to read the list, but he writes a list of the desires of the flesh. But what I really want to point out is he says, and things like these. Because it's real easy to go, um, you know, idolatry. No, I'm, I'm good with that. No idolatry in my life. And he goes on, but he says, but it's things like these. This is not a conclusive list. So desires that come from the flesh are not a good thing, <laughs> obviously. Okay, so it's not every desire is good. Um, in James 1.14, it says, Each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. So there are evil desires, okay? Just, I, I don't want to belabor the point that not every desire is good. So we have to be cunning, right? We always have to go to the level of motive and say, why do I want to do that so much? Why do I want that? And examine it for a while. Because we live in a very complicated world. We live in a world at war. Um, so there are desires of the flesh. We're not supposed to walk in them. There are desires that come from the evil one. Okay, we're not alone in this world. God gives us desires. Everything that is good that God gives, you know there's a counterfeit for, right? Everything that's good, there's a counterfeit. You have the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have the unholy trinity, the flesh, the devil, and the world. Everything is counterfeited in this world. That's, and so there's, there's counterfeit desires as well. And so Satan can give desires. This, this uh, real quick look at this. In Acts, um, Peter said, Ananias, why did you let Satan rule your thoughts to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep for yourself part of the money you receive from this land? So Satan interjected a thought into Ananias' mind, a desire. You know, I don't need to give this away. I'm giving some. I'm already being generous. What's the big deal? 
Well, the big deal was he really he said to God, I'm going to give this money. And, and then he kind of changed his mind. Satan interjected a desire. Yes? So in that case, it wasn't even that, that, that person or Ram and I had to give everything. He didn't have to give everything. Right. He could have said, okay, I sold the house. Here's 50% of it. Okay, uh, he didn't have to say, okay, here's 100%, but I should give 50 or whatever. Right. Right. So one, he didn't follow through with what he said he was going to do, what he wanted to do originally. But Satan came and gave him this thought, right? Satan gave us thoughts. I mean, haven't you, well, look, look, here's a really helpful question, at least for me. When you get this thought all of a sudden, now the easy ones are, I mean, the ones that are easy, like the thought is to lie, you know, don't, don't tell the truth right here, or whatever that is, those are easy. But sometimes when a thought comes up, ask yourself, where did it come from? Especially if there's no context for it. Whenever there's a thought or a temptation and there's no context for that thought, ask yourself where to come from. Because if it is Satan, if it's the adversary, the enemy giving you a thought, you have to fight him on his ground. Fighting a different battle won't help. So the enemy can give us thoughts. All right? We just need to understand desires can come from that as well. Um, and then there's the desires that come from the good. Well, before I go there, let me say this. Uh, there are desires that come from the wound, the, the ways we've been wounded in our life. They create patterns of living, right? There are certain things that is, they're very hard for you to do, even though they're good things to do, because of the wound, because if something says, don't offer that, don't offer that, they're going to tell you they don't want it, or it won't be helpful, or whatever it is. So desires that come from the wound, they're very hard to understand and discern, but you've got to watch out for them. I have to watch out for those things. Because those wounds create certain things that we want to do or not want to do to protect ourselves. And then there are desires that come from the good heart. Okay? So we know that. So that gets us to this verse. This is why Paul says, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. Because one, we need to be wholehearted. We need to bring our whole self to something. But he's saying, that's bringing who you are to the world. When you do your work with your whole heart, you're bringing the effect of your life to the world. So we have to do that. So... Now, let me see what the next thing is. So what I want to do is take you through this movie, Patch Adams. And this is a great, how many, how many have seen Patch Adams? OK. So you, you remember the, you know, we might want to crack the door just because it's awfully warm in here. Is it? It is really warm in here. I don't know if we open the door, if that would help or that would make it hotter. I think it's hotter. It's more fair. <laughs> it's more fair. <laughs> OK. So Patch Adams, you know, it's in the beginning of the movie, they, they tell you this, but here is, here is this man, he, his, he gets to such a low point in his life that he tries to take his own life unsuccessfully. He survives a, his own suicide attempt and realizes, I'm in trouble, so he admits, his, admits himself to a state mental hospital. And it's in this place, this dark place, where he finds his heart. And so he finds it both through a conversation with one of the patients there, as well as his as, as an interaction with his roommate. So watch how his heart is actually awakened to what's written there and his greatest desire in this. Come on. This is phenomenal. There we go. OK. What do you see when you look at me, Arthur? Michael, I'll see you around. Patch. Rudy, stop. You're throwing off my rhythm. You go blind. Please. I have to go to the Go. Right over there, 15 feet away. I would, but... Uh, what, the squirrels? How many? There's only one just now. You can't go to the bathroom because of one squirrel. If I get off the bed, I'll get the others. Oh, Rudy. That's not the point. They're squirrels. Squirrels, Rudy. They're one of the most amiable creatures on the planet. Oh, no, they're not. On the list of hostile predators, they're right above the bottom. Just above baby chicks and slugs. What could they possibly want? Your nuts? <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> Come on, I'll take you out. Don't move. Don't move. 
Another one. It's only a bit of it on the rail. Be careful, it's gonna jump. Schedule time. I'm leaving. And have you thought about what you'll do? I want to help people. Last night with Rudy, I connected to another human being. I want more of that. I want to learn about people. I want to help them with their troubles. That's what I do. But you suck at it. You don't even look at people when they're talking. You do it right there. <laughs> I love it. You don't even look at people when you're talking, and you can't even look at them then. It's just hysterical. <laughs> Um, because, and we didn't even get into this, you know, here at this, at this conference, but you see, because the glory of your life is so needed in this world, your particular effect that you were created to have, as revealed through your desires, that there has been a warfare, an assault, mounted against your heart your entire life. And everything was mounted to put your heart to sleep. The evil one cannot take your desires away, but he certainly can deaden them to a degree that they're numb, they're asleep, they're veiled, they're unconscious, or whatever term you want to use about it. And for every person, there needs to be an awakening. God is always trying to awaken our desires, okay, because we have to be aware of them. We have to understand what they are so that we can walk in those things. So we find this verse in, um, in fact, you know what? I'm sure it's just right here. Let me just get to it. Yeah, Isaiah 52.1. Awake, awake, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength and put on your garments of splendor. Okay, splendor, as you remember, is another word for glory, right? It means the same thing. Glory, you can use the word splendor, brilliance, abundance, beauty, strength. All of these are the same word for glory. So here you see this example where God is saying, awaken. I want you to put on your garment of strength, of glory in your life. And God has to do this because of this assault that we are continually under in our life. He has to awaken us. Now, what I want to do for a second is I want you to write down, I want you to think of and write down a situation in your life where what you encountered, a conversation, something you got to do, something you observed, something you got to be involved in, whatever it is, where in doing that, you thought, oh, I love this. I could do this all the time. I think I'm made to do this. But nothing came of it. Okay? So think about that and write that down for a second. You're not going to share this, so you don't have to be careful with what you write. 
Okay, so a situation where you, in that moment or moments or whatever it was, you felt like, oh, I love that. This is what I want to do. This is me. It was an awakening moment for you. But you couldn't, you didn't get to walk it out after that. Now, if you can't think of anything, it's probably for one or two reasons. One, you're tired. <laughs> or number two is that's been blocked, right? It's just been blocked. You're not finding it yet because those are important moments in our life. All right, so let me keep going. We're just, we'll go deeper in this, okay? And we're going to get into other ways to kind of pull this out. So God will maneuver situations, choreograph, that's a better word, choreograph situations where he's awakening our heart. Right. I've been in situations, I shared one back on, uh, back on, feels like a week ago, yesterday, um, you know, where, I, where something came in front of me and I so want to do it, I felt like this is what I want to do with my life, and it disappeared on me. And God said, right desire, wrong opportunity. He'll do those things because he's awakening our heart to say, see how you want to do this? This is the effect of your life. This is the desire put in your heart. And he does these awakening situations. And it may come through a conversation with a person. You know, they're talking to you, and they're not trying to dig or probe or bring anything to you. You're just having a conversation, and something awakens in your heart, and you remember something. Or you're watching a movie, or you see someone at church, and something's going on, and you're thinking, I want to do that. God's awakening your heart. He does that all the time for us. And awakening situations are never a waste of time. It's easy to go, well, it didn't turn into anything. What a waste of time. Oh, it's never a waste of time because our heart has to be awakened. We have to understand our desires. Now, what I find, okay, what I find is that, um, look, he's agreeing with me. He's doing this. Either that or you're listening to music and you're, anyway, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I totally threw myself off track on that one. Okay, what I find is that many people don't want to live in the realm of desire because honestly it's too painful. See the thing is if you're going to connect with your heart and you're going to go after what are the things that God's written on my heart, when you live in the realm of desire you got the whole deal. All right? You got things you love, you got joy, you got fulfillment, you got excitement and you have pain and suffering and disappointment. You got everything. And most people opt for nothing. It's all or nothing with the heart and they opt for nothing. But when you offer nothing, you've got, you're lost. You and I are just lost. We don't know where to go from there because it's God who's riding on our heart the desires that steer us, that guide us. All right, so um, um, <laughs> yeah, why was I putting this up here? Oh, I know why. <laughs> so awakened desire is not enough. Just because you can say, oh, I know what I love to do. You know, it was like for me, in, in, out of, when I came out of college, I thought, I love gymnastics. I'm going to do it my whole life. Now, it's easy now to look at me and go, yeah, right. Yeah, you're going to do that your whole life. Boy, were you stupid. But, you know, when you're in that moment, all you know is, I love this. You think that's everything. So awakened desire is not enough. We have to understand deeper what that really is, right? What's, there's always a desire underneath the desire. There's something deeper about it that we don't know yet. So Paul says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay? So desire is one thing, but we need spiritual wisdom and understanding of that desire. We need to go deeper. So there is a process that I'm trying to describe here, which I didn't mention before. There is a pattern of God, and this is really helpful for discerning your life. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to give you are tools to interpret your life and your situations. And there's this pattern that's very helpful of God, and that is awaken, deepen, and fulfill. 
God is always about awakening the desires in our heart and then deepening our understanding of it. And then he says, now go do it. Go walk in it. Fulfill it now. And then he awakens more and he deepens our understanding more and he says, now go walk that out. Awaken, deepen, fulfill. If, if we remember that, then we can interpret our life better. Okay? Because he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We need deepening in the understanding of our desires. Um, okay, so let me take you back to Patch Adams now. So, Patch leaves uh, the state mental hospital because he was self-admitted so he could walk out. He leaves and he enrolls in medical school because wh what did he say to that doctor? What did he discover? Do you remember his words? Well, besides, yeah, but you suck at it. Besides that, I know you were going to like that one. I, that wasn't really the point of the clip, okay? <laughs> this is quite the audience. You're great, but these guys over here, just, okay. Okay, first of all, you remember, he meets, yeah, just pointed at him. Just, no, you're kind of in there. So you remember, the, the guy says to him, he, remember he puts a piece of tape, well, you didn't see the whole thing, he puts a piece of, piece of tape on this guy's cup because it's leaking coffee, and he looks at him and he says, he calls him Patch. And Patch Adams gets that, that smile, that knowing smile like, wow, I think that is me. I think that's part of me. That, resonates with my heart okay so first there's that he's called patch and he feels like yeah I do like to patch things and then he says to the to the psychologist the counselor there the the resident doctor he says last night with Rudy I connected with another human being I want more of that I want to help people with their troubles so the for the first time he goes that's what I love I love helping people I really connected with somebody deep level okay so so there is an awakening of his heart now now he's in medical school and it's just the very beginning, okay? So what I want you to hear, he's, he's going to be talking to another medical student. They're out getting a bite to eat. And I want you to hear now the depth. So you saw the awakening of his desire in his heart. Now you're going to see the deepening of his understanding of his desires, okay? Can I ask you one question? What? Did you buy anything the dean was saying today? What do you mean? That whole drill sergeant thing. Like, we're going to make doctors out of you medical scum. I'll drop down, give me 20. Mm -hmm. The whole marine thing. We're not even going to see a patient until the third year. Up until then, it's just memorizing facts. Why don't they just shove the book up? Right here on the colon. That's where it's going anyway. Thanks very much. So, why do you want to be a doctor? I want to help. I want to connect with people. A doctor interacts with people at their most vulnerable offers treatment, but he also offers counsel and hope. That's why I love the idea of being a doctor. Okay. So what, what is the deeper understanding he has now about his desires? <laughs> I know it's hot in here. And I know it's been a long... Okay, so what he says is, he said, I want to connect with people at their most vulnerable point. Okay, that's huge. Because just because you like to connect with people, that's not enough of an answer. Is how do you like to connect with people? Where do you like to connect with them? And he wants to connect with somebody at a very vulnerable point in their life. Not just sitting over a cup of coffee, hey, how you doing? That's not him. He wants to find somebody in a crisis point in his life. That's what he loves. And he said, um, he said, I want to offer treatment, but I also want to counsel and give hope. That's why I love the idea of being a doctor. See, what I love about that is he could say, what's my calling to be a doctor? No. He's saying, no, that's the avenue that I bring the effect in my life. I want to be a doctor so I'm at a vulnerable point in a person's life where I give counsel and hope. That's what I love. That's what I want to do. See, that's genius. That's, that is understanding, going to a deeper understanding of the desires of our heart. That, now you can guide your life off of that versus doctor, teacher, uh, whatever, whatever you want to put to it. So God is always up to deepening the understanding of our desires. So Psalm 119, give discernment to me, your servant, and then I will understand your decrees. He's always deepening our understanding of our desires because, again, you know, the desires are like coded form. We've got to decipher it. Um, okay, I'm just going to, I want it because there's a number of things I want us to talk through and work through. So let me just speed through a couple things. Let me just show you this other verse very quickly because it's such a good one. You've seen this.
Proverbs 19.2, it's not good for a person to be without knowledge. And he who hurries his steps errs. See, this is why God awakens and then he deepens. And if we don't understand deepening, we're going to go, come on, I've got to make this happen. I should be doing this. And guys say, no, you shouldn't be doing this yet. Not yet. Time's not yet. Um, okay, so he has to awaken, deepen our understanding, and then he says, now go do it. And, and he does do that because there's nothing like learning by doing it. You know, there's a process where all of a sudden I can't talk about this anymore. I'm not going to know anymore. You just got to go out and do it. You know, and that's why I'm, I, I see so many people that are stuck. You know, they get to a point and they go, oh, this is what I love to do. This is the impact I love to have. And they do nothing. You know, well, I can't get paid for it. Do it anyway. Do you love it? Then do it because you love it. You know, well, I, I don't have time. Well, do you work 24-7? No, you've got time. Read about it. Go talk to it. Have a conversation, you know, because we'll learn from it. It brings life to our heart, and we learn from it. We've got to be doing it. Okay. Um, let, me, let me jump down now into this. Well, you know what? I want to show you one more verse because this is so, so incredibly important. Luke 6. Jesus says, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. All right, there's a calling verse right there, right? What are we supposed to do in the world? We're supposed to bring good to the world. Where is the good? It's stored in our heart. It's right there. That's one point. But the second point is the calling of your life, the good in your life, the glory in your life is recognizable, right? Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. It's, you can see it. We can find it. We can discover it, okay? It's not so coded, so mysterious that we can never read it. We can. We can read it, but we have to go to the heart. Okay. So this is, now this is what I want to get into. How is it that you actually read the desires of your heart? Where do you look? How do you discern? How are you cunning with desires? Okay. So I want to get into the how-tos, and I'm going to ask you some questions and have you do some more, some writing, some more kind of thought streaming with your notes. Um, there's three things that we have to do if we're going to read our heart or understand our calling. We have to listen to our heart, we have to listen to others, and we have to listen to God. Right? Sounds pretty general. Listen to our heart, listen to others, and listen to God. So let me go through listen to your heart, specifically. The first thing is, you and I need to figure out, we have to look at strength of desire. Right? We truly are creatures of desire. And I'll tell you what, nowadays, and we've been talking about it, you know, in these, in these different sessions, we are exposed to so many things right now that we are filled with desires. And I'm talking about good desires. I mean, you know, I love History Channel. I love Discovery Channel. I love documentaries. And I love movies. I love all that stuff. But I'll tell you what, you watch some of these things, and they're so well done. They're so persuasive in the way they've been written, and the narrative, and, and the visuals, and all this. You know, that I watch, you know, an hour show and I'm convinced the calling of my life is to save whales. It is the, it will change the world. There is no doubt. That's the biggest thing on God's heart, you know. And then I watch the next documentary and I know it's to save the rainforest. And then the next document, you know, they're just persuasive. And so you can't go with any desire. You have to look at strength of desire, right? What are you compelled to do? We have to look for that. Um, Thomas Merton is this amazing writer, and he's written quite a bit, and, and I was just kind of introduced to him a little while back. Actually, I was reading someone else's book, and he kept quoting this guy named Thomas Merton, and I went, whoa, this guy, i got to see his stuff. And let me, let me read you one of the things he said. It's so good. He said, to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is itself to succumb to the violence of our times. Frenzy destroys the fruitfulness of our work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. All right, this idea that, yeah, there's a lot of things we're concerned about, we care about, but we need to find the thing that's the strongest desire and go with that because God put that on our heart. That's what he put on our heart. Not everything we were just persuaded that we should care about. They're important, but they, they may not be your thing or my thing. 
So we have to look for strength of desire. There are certain things that has haunted you your whole life. There are certain things that you've cared about that have really bothered you, you know, about why does that have to happen? Why do people have to treat, them, treat each other like that? Why does there have to be this kind of poverty? Why, I mean, you can go, and there's a million things, right? There's something that's been haunting you your whole life. Um, often, often, our strongest desire is experienced as our greatest curiosity. Often our greatest, our strongest desire is experienced as our greatest curiosity. I, I remember I was uh, in my daughter's, uh, my daughter, the, the teacher had a, um, you know, it's a teacher uh, student parent conference. And I, I really have always hated going to those because, you know, they last for an hour, hour and a half, they really should take five minutes. And I don't know if the teacher just likes finally having an adult audience, or I don't know what it is, but they go on and on about stuff that just doesn't seem important, and I just want to say, I trust you, okay? I trust you, I'm leaving now. And so, you know, I'm in this one, and by then I'm, you know, I'm seeing if there's gum stuck underneath the table, and, and I'm, you know, looking into graffiti on the thing, and. And I started looking around the room. Anyway, I'm looking around the room, and I come upon a little poster that the teacher purchased or was purchased for, and she put it up. And it was worth the entire evening. And it was a quote by Albert Einstein. And it was, curiosity has its reasons for existing. OK, that's amazing. Because you see, you are curious about certain things for a reason. And you're not curious about other things for a reason. So that's why you have to go after, what are you most curious about? What have you always been curious about? Because that is revealing the deepest desire of your heart or why you are here, your purpose, your, the weightiness of your life. You know, I remember in college, I took a freshman psychology class like everybody does. I loved it. I didn't want to be a counselor, but boy, I'll tell you what, I was fascinated by the teaching on why we do what we do. Now, I never took another course after that, because that was just a freshman class. But then I took, as a business major, I took a marketing course. I was fascinated by it. I didn't care about selling things, but I was fascinated by the idea of why do people buy what they buy. And, and I, I didn't realize back then in college what was so fascinating to me. But now I look back and I go, oh, I know why. I know why. I'm just fascinated by why people do what they do and, and what are they made to do. So, Curiosity has its reasons for existing. So let me ask you this question now. So this is time for you to write. What is it that you are most curious about? If you were to walk, you know this question, if you were to walk into a bookstore and you could go anywhere you want to go, you could buy any book you wanted to buy, what section would you go to? Because you're fascinated by it. Where would you go? What would the subject be? Or think back at the books you do have sitting next to your bed or on your bookshelf. So what I'm asking you to write down is, what are you most curious about? And it may be one, two, three, or four things. Just give it a, give it a try. OK, I'm going to ask you next. I'm gonna, let, let's keep moving. Just keep these questions with you. And they're the kind of questions that I'm always trying to ask myself all the time anyway. Um, the Scottish poet Robert Louis Stevenson said this. This is amazing. OK, so listen carefully, because I, I don't want to say it twice. It'll take too long. <laughs> to know what you prefer, instead of humbly saying amen, to what the world tells you you ought to prefer is to have kept your soul alive. We are so quick to say, well, what, what, what should I love? What should I be doing? 
what should my life be like? And he's saying, stop doing that because the world will tell you what you ought to be doing. They, they, they will tell you what you ought to love and not love. And he said, stop asking them what you prefer. Ask yourself what you prefer because that will keep your soul alive. You'll lose it otherwise. Right? It goes back to the desires of your heart. Living there. Such a powerful thing. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Okay, so we just talked about strength of desire, right? Your strongest, not any desire, but your strongest desire, what you're haunted by, your greatest curiosity, that's what you need to hone in on, okay? Not just what's, what's the, the, the newest thing that's been put on you or because of the documentary you've seen or what you heard at church or someone told you or an article you read. But, um, let me talk about that first already. Um, but, so there's, we have, you have to look at strength of desire. The second thing you have to look at is consistency of desire, right? Consistency of desire. Now, I'm going to take you back to Patch Adams in this one. Um, so Patch now, like I said, he's, he's, he's been in medical school. Now he's in his residency program. And Patch is being Patch Adams, right? What did he say he wanted to bring to people in their most desperate times? Counsel and hope. And this is what he's doing. Well, for, the, for the, uh, the, the doctor who's over the residency program, counsel and hope is not important. It's, it's the, the, uh, it's the administering, administration of the medical practice, period. You know? So he hates Patch Adams. To, Patch, to him, Patch is a disgrace to the medical community. He's a goofball. You know, he hates him. So he is doing everything he can to get rid of Patch Adams. Now, in this scene, yeah, I got to make sure of the rest of it. Yeah, in this scene, um, he is actually brought before the medical board. And uh, what, what the, uh, the head of residency program is asking is the medical board not only kick him out of school, but take his white coat away, the whole deal. Just say, you will never graduate. You will never have a medical degree. And so Patch has to now stand in front of the board and explain his behavior, his life, his desires. And you're going to see a guy who is very deep now. He really does understand what the desires of his heart are, the effect he wants to have. He, he, is, he has discovered the str his strongest desire and consistency because at this point, this is the end of the movie, and you've all seen it, so we're not, I'm not spoiling it for you. But what's happened is, over these years, um, he has experienced the death of some of his patients that he's loved dearly. He's experienced the death of the girl he fell in love with, who was actually killed by one of his patients, who he's trying to give freedom to and, and encouragement that you can make it. You know, he, all sorts of things have happened to him. So I want you to see now the consistency of desire in this man. Share their compassion. Let that be contagious. Mr. Adams, I demand that you turn and address the board. Sir, I, I want to be a doctor with all my heart. I wanted to become a doctor so I could serve others. And because of that, I've lost everything. But I've also gained everything. I've shared the lives of patients and staff members at the hospital. I've laughed with them. I've cried with them. This is what I want to do with my life. And as God is my witness, no matter what your decision today, sir, I will still become the best damn doctor the world has ever seen. Now, you have the ability to prevent me from graduating. You can keep me from getting the title and the white coat. But you can't control my spirit, gentlemen. You can't keep me from learning. You can't keep me from studying. So you have a choice. You could have me as a professional colleague, passionate, or you can have me as an outspoken outsider, still adamant. Either way, I'll probably still be viewed as a thorn. But I promise you one thing. I am a thorn that will not go away. Is that all? I hope not, sir. Okay, so you see now the consistency over all these years from way back at the beginning of the movie. It hasn't changed. You know, that desire is still there. It hasn't changed. It hasn't morphed into something different. It's gotten deeper now, right? And, and I love the fact that he says, you can't stop me, right? I'm still going to study. I'm still going to help people. You can't stop me. This is who I am. 
And, and we just need to be that way, right? This is what's in my heart. And yeah, you cannot give me this opportunity, but you're not stopping me. I'm going to study. I'm going to meet with people. I mean, I run into people all the time and go, well, do you know what the problem is? My church won't let me do this program. And I'm saying, do you know people? Do it. What is it with the pastor won't anoint me to do this? What, what do you need permission for? It's who you are. It's what God put on your heart. You want to help people in this way, right? Whether it's building a company, organization, counseling, uh, whatever it is, you know, just do it. We need to get to a point where we say, no, no one can stop me. Now, I'm not talking about the immaturity of, I'll do what I want when someone's saying, yeah, but well, that's fine, but let's, let's learn some things first. Let's grow up a little bit. That's a different deal. But that consistency of desire. So strength of desire and consistency of desire are like this, right? They go together. Those two things are very, very strong indicators. All right, so I'm not going to give you time to answer it now because I have other questions I want you to answer, but I want you to at some point think back. What is just consistent about me? My whole life, I have always loved this. This is what I've always wanted to do. You see, one of the things that we do in, a, in this, one of the retreats over calling is we have every person tell their story, their entire story. Because you see, when you look at your story, you can see what's consistent. I'm gonna give you one example, I'll move on to the next point. When I was the focus on the family, and, and folks in the family was a tremendous place to work. I loved working there. I think Dr. Dobson is one of the greatest Christian men, you know, in time. I do. It's just, it was a great experience. Now, with that disclaimer, let me tell my story. <laughs> so, I'm working in public policy. Actually, I'm doing a little better at this time, not back to when I was just absolutely miserable. But I, I was hiring some people to work with me. We were kind of, in my department that I was over, we were kind of consultants around the country for these public, Christian public policy groups. And so we put up, I don't know how the word got out, but word got out, it, it, we used monster.com or something, and we were getting the word out we were hiring. And so we had a barrage of people asking to be interviewed for this position I had. So at one point we narrowed them down to like three people. We flew, I, I flew them all in. They didn't know they were all there at the same time, but we were kind of staging things so they didn't bump into each other. And I would tell them, guard your heart very carefully. You are here because you want this desperately, okay? I know, I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? This is not, you're not looking for more money, not at folks in the family, so you're here because you want to do this. And I said, and I know that you think that this is heaven on earth right here. It cannot get better than working at folks in the family. I know what you're thinking. And so guard your heart carefully because, you know, it's like the, that, you know, reality show, that someone's going to get kicked off the island. <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, when I looked at it, they could all get kicked off the island. So... Anyway, this one guy, he wanted to do it so desperately. He was about 26 years old. He worked for a pharmaceutical company in Houston. He was making, I mean, he's 26 years old. This was probably, this is probably 15 years ago. He was making $70,000 a year. And I said, you understand, we're going to more than cut your salary in half, right? I mean, can you do this? And he goes, yeah, it'll be hard, but, you know, like, we can kind of negotiate this, right? He said, first of all, I don't have the power of negotiation. And I said, and I've worked here long enough to tell you the answer is no. I can go to HR for you, but the real answer is no. And, you know, his countenance dropped because he just, you know, he said, I, I can't do it. And I said, well, then we probably should stop here because you don't need to invest your heart more in this process. No, 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 no. You know, maybe God's up to this and all this stuff. And so we kept talking, and I knew this wasn't going to work. So... We're, you know, I'm, I'm in, you know, focus on the family's cubicle land. You know, you look down the hall, and there's bazillions of cubicles, you know. So we're sitting in this cubicle, and, I, and I, as we're talking, I said to him, I said, well, now tell me, how are you doing now what you think you're going to do here? You know, and he said, well, that's the thing is, I know I'm supposed to do what you're doing, but I'm, you know, I, I work a lot of hours with this pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, and I said, no, I know that, I know that, but I do know you have time at home, and I... I do know, you know, that you have weekends, and so, like, how are you doing this now? How are you going out and helping other organizations bring, you know, force to Christian principles and public policy? And he said, no, I just don't have time. Anyway, so he kept telling me this. Well, what are you reading? You know, well, I don't have time to read, because I thought he was going to say, you know, uh, Children at Risk or, you know, whatever books are out there, the books that I hated reading, because <laughs> it's not me. And uh, he kept saying, well, I don't have time to read. So I said, lean forward. And I kind of leaned forward, and I leaned forward, because I'm sitting in a cubicle. And I looked at him, and I said, you think, you think God's called you to work here, right? He said, yeah. I said, bullshit. 
<laughs> and he just kind of froze. That was not on tape. He kind of froze. <laughs> and, and, and I used that not because I like to swear, but because I needed to jolt something in him. Because I was looking at his life, and there was no consistent pattern of this desire. None. That's what I'm looking for, because what's true is consistent. And I knew what he wanted was to work in this, quote, ideal place. That's what he wanted. It wasn't the job. It wasn't in his heart. And so that's why consistency of desire is so important. That's why you have to look at a pers our own story. Let me make a person. We have to look at our own story to understand who we really are. Look at the whole story. Not a scene in your story, but the whole story, OK? All right, so. Can we pause a second? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you betcha. But what's really fascinating is really the, the crux of that verse is to speak a word that is needed in the moment for the building up of that person. And honestly, sometimes there are certain words you need to use that the Christian community goes, oh! and, but it's needed in that moment to jolt somebody, to say, I did this because I'm trying to get to something in you. you know. Of course, you didn't get that on tape, which would have explained what I just said. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said, what I like best about experience is that it is such an honest thing. OK? Think about that. C.S. Lewis said, what I like best about experience is that it is such an honest thing. You see, you can BS me in the moment. But if I watch your life long enough, I'll figure you out. You can tell me what you believe. But if I watch you long enough, I know what you really believe. I know what you really love. I know what you're really afraid of. You know, so. Consistency of desire is such an important thing. All right. So we looked at strength of desire, consistency of desire, and the third one is stories of desire. Right? There are certain stories that we love. Right? You, you go to a friend, you go, oh, I saw this movie. It's the best movie in the world. You've got to see this thing. And they go see it, and they go, yeah, it was OK. Yeah, it was good. You know, if they're kind to you and they don't like it, they go, yeah, it was good. And you're thinking, I don't get it. You didn't love that movie? You know, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. No, there's something about you that made you love that movie, that story, whether it's movie or book form or whatever form it's in, okay? Stories that resonate with your heart are telling you something about you. Your heart's saying, that's what I'm made like. That's what I'm supposed to do. So let me ask you a question. A lot of you have already worked through this question before. What stories do you love? Just write them down in the form of movies or books. What stories do you love? And then maybe just in a few words, what was the theme of the movie? Why did you love it? What was it about that made you love it? So go ahead and write that down for a minute. Okay, so while you're doing this, I'm going to tell you, it's funny, because now, now there's just all guys in the room. <laughs> I, I don't know if I should have said that word and I just lost it or what. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really worried about it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's serious. I didn't believe that. Um, I, I said yesterday, if you were in, in the workshop, that I, I, I think it was yesterday, I found <clears throat> one day I realized that I love I mean, I never thought about this before to put it together, but I've always really been intrigued and loved movies about, you know, a bodyguard, secret service, that kind of a thing. And usually those movies are not that great. They're just kind of stupid. The acting, you know, it's, it's just kind of a B movie a lot of times. But I've always been fascinated. Even if it's not good acting, I like it. I just love to watch it. You know, my boys look at me and say, Dad, come on, you have to have better taste than that. You know, <laughs> they're just laughing at me. And so finally I thought, why do I like those movies? And, and there's something in that, as I was saying yesterday, about the idea that a bodyguard or the Secret Service, I just watched a documentary on that while I was working out. Um, you know, what they're doing is, they're, they're, for instance, the president, they go, the president has a very powerful position. He has a big influence. And we've got to protect him so that nothing can subvert him from having the influence and the power and the results that he needs to have. Right? And I, and I thought, see, that's what I love. I love to find out what is the effect of a person's life. And then I go to what's blocking it, what's in the way, what could subvert it. You know, that's what I love to do. 
Now, will I ever be in the CIA? No. Secret Service? No. Police? I love guns, but I'm never going to be in the police. You know, I'm just not. But I have to dig deeper to say, but what is it about that? See, I've had too many guys, like I had a guy talk to me on the phone. He said, I love music, but I can't make a living from it. And so I'm just so discouraged. And I said, well, that's because you're not answering the deeper asking the deeper question. What is it about music that you love? Is it composing music? Is it playing music? Is it singing? Is it writing songs? What is it? Let's go deeper because whatever it is, is transcendent. You can bring that in any situation through any means. You find that and you won't get so discouraged because you can't make that particular thing happen. Oh, that's right. We we're on stories of desire. Just was thinking, why did I say all that? Okay. So for instance, you know, one of my favorite movies is Bagger Vance. I, don't, I still don't play golf. But I love what Bagger does. He goes into Juna's life and helps him figure out, find his authentic swing. That's what I love to do for people. That's, that's what I'm most fascinated by. So strength of desire, if you're going to listen to our hearts, strength of desire, consistency of desire, stories of desire, and words of desire. There are certain words that you love to use because they're you. Now here's what's really hard. It's really hard for you to know what those are because you use them so much, you're not even aware of it anymore. You really need someone who's around you a lot and say, just ask them, what kind of, what words do I use frequently? And, you know, people who pay attention, they go, oh, you always talk about, you know, if it was me, you always talk about calling or purpose or destiny or clarity or, you know, my wife, she, again, she'll say some words and roll her eyes like, you're so annoying. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm not putting her in a bad light. She's, I love her. She's sweet to me and everything else, but, but she's not here, so I'm making fun of her. Okay. Because I think she does that to me when she speaks. She'll watch this. Yeah, you know what? Video tape does not get into Colorado. <laughs> so there are certain words that you use because, again, it resonates with your heart. And so it's good to ask some people that you're around a lot, what words do I tend to use? And they're, it's very revealing about what's on your heart, what you love, what, how you hear and see and think. Um, okay. So we've talked about listening to your heart. Remember the three things. Listen to your heart, listen to others, listen to God. So in the ten, five minutes we have, let me hit the two others because it won't take long. You, we have to listen to our heart because we have to understand what's been written there, okay? We have to listen to others because we're too close for clarity. The truth is, as I said yesterday, it's very hard for us to discern I'm just trying to think of my words yesterday. Um, it's very hard for us to discern the, the brilliance, the splendor, the weightiness of our life because it's us. We live with it. So to us, it seems so ordinary, so natural, so everybody can do it-ish, right? Because we live with it. All, it's been in us. It takes someone else to go, I didn't see what you just saw. How did you notice that? Or how did you do that just then with that person or that thing or that company or that organization or that product? How did you do that? And usually people go, well, I don't know. Didn't you know to do that? I didn't know to do that. Didn't you pick that up? I didn't pick that up. It takes someone else to show us that what we have is extraordinary. It's, it's unique to us. We need the eyes of others. C.S. Lewis said, in each of my friends, there is something that only the other friend can fully bring out. I am not large enough to bring the whole man into activity. We need other people to call us out, right? To say, that's unique to you. That's good. Live in it. Develop it. Offer it. It's powerful. We need that. We absolutely need other people. We cannot do this alone. There's a guy who wrote a book um, called, um, yeah, I'm getting tired. <laughs> Memory's going like this. I think, I think it's called The Pursuit of Purpose by Miles Monroe. And, and this one expression he had, it's probably really bad grammar, but it's a great expression. And it is, we are the way we are because of the why we are. You are the way you are because of the why you are. You see, it takes someone else to say, this is the way you are, right? This, Gary, this is what you do every time I'm with you. You start asking questions, and I know where you're going. You're trying to find out what's going on in my heart and desires. And, you know, and it, it, sometimes it takes someone to say something to that and say, so you see what you're, what you're about, your why is helping people find their calling or bringing clarity, you know. We need other people's eyes in our life to see the why we are because they can see the way we are better than we can see. 
because we're too close to it. It's too natural to us. Um, again, yeah, just, to, just a little more clarity to this. We need the eyes of others. We need their questions. We need their observations. We need, if they get prophetic words, we need the evaluation of others. We need all of that in our life. We absolutely need it. Absolutely need it. Um, okay, let me show you this verse. I think this is next up on my... Yeah, what, this is such a powerful verse. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He, who quar he quarrels against all sound wisdom. And I know the Miles Monroe quote I was trying to get. It wasn't the one I just gave you. <laughs> I'm telling you, something's short-circuited here. Uh, but, but that's a good verse. I mean, I made it work, didn't I, in the context? Because <laughs> I knew it was the wrong world, but I thought, okay, go with it here. Just remember the <laughs> What I was trying to tell you was... <laughs> yeah, okay. What, <laughs> at least I'm done. Okay, what he said was... <laughs> While your calling is personal, it is never private. While your calling is personal, it is never private. Meaning that your calling, your effect, your glory, and all that I talked about before, it's very personal and yours. It's yours and it's yours alone, and you have to bring it to the world, or it's missing. But it's not private. We can't discover it in private. We obviously can't offer it in private. Right? We have to connect with people. So while your calling is personal, it is never private. That was the other good thing he said. Okay. <laughs> Miles Monroe. He's actually a, he's a pastor and a speaker out of Jamaica. No, the Bahamas. Jamaica, the Bahamas. Yeah, yeah, Bahamas. So. You can come on in. You don't have to be a peeping Tom. <laughs> okay. But that's, that's, uh, that's such a powerful verse. Okay. So, right, listen to our heart. I told you how. Strength of desire, consistency of desire, stories of desire, words of desire. Yeah. And then I said we have to listen to others because there's things that they can see that we'll never be able to see on our own. And then the last thing is that we have to listen to God. Because the truth is that there are certain, everything I've spoken to you so far can be in the realm of wisdom, if you will, right? You look at your life, you look at your heart, and in one sense, it's wisdom that's bringing answers to us. But there are things that we need to know that wisdom will never get us to, ever. It can, it's, it's a realm wisdom just can't venture into. There are things unknown. And that's where the revelation of God has to come in. God has to speak to things that we will never know on our own. God knows what's coming, we don't. And oftentimes there are things important for us to know that's coming. And wisdom will not reveal it. It can't. It doesn't have the data to work with. Okay, there's certain things about our heart that wisdom can't get us because it's so deep and it's so hidden that God has to say something to us. We need the revelation of God. So listen to our heart, listen to others, listen to God. And uh, let me just take you real quickly back to this verse. I think I mentioned before. Yeah, I did. Uh, it was yesterday morning. Paul's praying that the Father of glory, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, there it is again, may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of God's calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So we need wisdom and revelation, always. And, and what happens, you've seen this, right? In the body of Christ, we either lean to the wisdom camp, which says, you just figure it out. Just use your brain, man. Figure it out. Take some more tests. Or there's the leaning into the revelation camp. Just ask God. He'll tell you when you need to know. It'll just happen. Now, are they both true? Yeah, they're both true. But it's both, like he said, wisdom and revelation, right? We live in the wisdom we, we've been given, and we, we glean from it. We try to grow in it. But we also go back to God and say, God, what do you need to tell me? This wisdom that I have, is it 100% right? Is it 80%? Is it 50% right? Talk to me about this. What do I need to know? And he speaks. He does speak to his children. How is it that he's going to guide you in the way that you should go, you know, instruct you in the way you should go, and on it goes? So, we need to have a spirit of wisdom and a revelation. He must speak. Um, okay, we are done. Uh, I, how about one minute, any question, just real quick. I know we're out of time, but any, yes? That first CSO's quote, 
the last part of that, it was, uh, what I like about experience is. Is that it is such an honest thing. Yep. And you got the other quote I gave, right? The, when I was in the cubicle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's in here. Yeah, that's, that's right. That, that was, uh, actually, John said that. Right. I'll take that. <laughs> so. Okay. So uh, we're, we're all done, but let me just say, the, the parts that we didn't talk about that I wish we had time was I wish I could have talked more about how do we live and deal with mystery, because mystery is a part of life. Okay? The other parts I didn't talk about was I'd love to have talked about the assault on our life. What does the assault against our calling look like and how do we deal with it? Extremely important. This is not an infomercial. I just want to say that there are other elements that are important. The other one is development, right? God has to develop us into a person, the man or woman who could yield, not yield, wield well the power of our life because most people don't wield power well, strength, weightiness, you know, that kind of thing. And he's got to develop us and there's a process for that. And then there's a whole idea of journey element of time. That's what I love that Lance talked about, right? I've been working on this for 10 years. There was a time where I had no money and I just had to do it. You know, I couldn't do anything with it. I stuck with it because I loved it. I mean, I loved that he was telling the story of journey. I loved it. So there's other things. I wish we had time, but anyway, thank you everybody. So we're break time, right? Break time till the next thing, which is at? Uh, at 345. 5, 345, so. We're all getting hungry. <laughs> yeah. I know. Oh, so she's saying, don't whine. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get to go watch. Oh. Well, your husband have air conditioning put in your car, then you don't have to worry about the heat. I have air conditioning, conditioning in my car. Well, then use it. It's just tiring to drive. Are you sure you want to? Are you sure you want to go down this road? <laughs> wisdom, wisdom, and I'm gonna give you some revelation.